Kia ora tato. welcome to this very special edition of No Boundaries, a World Cup edition after a match which sees New Zealand now hanging on to their hopes of a place in the top four by, dare I say it, the barest of margins after losing to Pakistan on the Duckworth Lewis system despite racking up their best ever score in a World Cup match, 402, uh, beaten uh, by 21 runs in the end by Pakistan after they turned it on with the bat as well. So plenty to talk about and our guests Colin Munro and Mike Hessen. I'll start with you Colin. Uh, I guess at the end of that innings, 402 runs on the board, we're thinking we're taking a step back from the edge of the cliff here. It didn't quite happen. No, it's a, I think it's a tough one to swallow as, as spectators, as supporters, and I think even the players in India, I think they'll be asking themselves some questions and, on how and why, because I think when we look at the whole World Cup, we started off with a hiss and a roar. We've obviously got the four losses, but then... This one is sort of, you know, kicking the teeth, you know, like you said, 400, over 400 runs. Um, a lot of positives to talk about uh, in the batting side of things, but then, you know, one man came out. Usually we talk about, you know, one man can beat you in a T20 game, but sort of one man came and, and, and beat us in a one-day game. So, fuck as a man, heads up, you know, you played really well, and yeah, now we've got one game we need to win. I suppose the thing we have to take into consideration here, Hess, was that this is a very small ground in which to defend any sort of total. But this is Pakistan. And what is it about Pakistan, especially when they're backed into a corner when we play them in the World Cup? Yeah, they seem to operate the best when they're in turmoil, really. Um, and that seems to be the way that their, their whole cricket span has been in terms of when there's backs are, backs are against the wall, often, as you said, against New Zealand, and they front up with a performance like that, or, or at least enough to win the game. So... Yeah, I mean, look, I know Tinnaswami Stadium very well. Obviously, I haven't been there with RCB. It's, uh, it's at altitude, it's a very small ground, uh, and it doesn't spin. And it hasn't spun for, for many years, actually, since the 2018 season. So uh, I think there's always a bit of a concern there. Um, the pitch always looks a little bit mosaic. It looks a, a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle, and, and you think that it's going to turn or be slow. Um, but as I said, it hasn't for many years. And, and the fact that, that we went in with four spinners was always going to be a massive risk. And... You know, when the ball doesn't spin um, and you're playing against, you're bowling against a set batter, small boundaries at altitude, uh, we saw the result tonight. Was that a situation that was forced on New Zealand by the injuries to a degree that they went in with a bowling attack that in the end didn't look quite right for the conditions? Maybe. I was just going to ask Hess as well, because obviously he's been there a long, a long time with RCB, but to go in with like you said, two, two, two seamers and then Daryl Mitchell as the third seam option. Um, do you reckon it was because of, because of the day and the time they were playing that they maybe thought, obviously the wicket looked a little bit drier when, when they were talking about it pre-game, but going in sometimes a day game, you just get, especially in India, just m sort of being made to make those changes and go, okay, well, it's going to be dry, it's going to spin. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to know whether that was, a, as I said, a tactical thing or whether they were actually had no options. You know, Jamison's just got off the park. Lockie Ferguson's not fully fit. And obviously, Henry's gone home. So, you know, if that was the case, then you've got to make the most of what you've got. Um, but, yeah, being a day game might have made it lean that way. But, I mean, all of the, all the T20 games you play, um, you struggle to get four over the spin, let alone six, and certainly not eight out of 20. So, you, you know, it just doesn't just doesn't turn and, and there's enough pace in the wicket where it slides on and up. So, you know, it could well have been situational and, and New Zealand were played into a corner. Pakistan obviously went the other way, didn't they? They played four seamers um, and they, you know, all those seamers pretty much went the journey as well. So it's a really tough place to bowl regardless, but spin in particular. For those of us who actually need their beauty sleep, un unlike you good looking blokes, um, you go to bed, probably a lot of people went to bed after New Zealand made 400 plus thinking, yep, we've got this in the bag. Let, let's talk about the positives. It'd be nice to talk about this New Zealand innings because, you know, quite an extraordinary achievement to get over 400 runs. Uh, first time New Zealand's done that in a World Cup match. And it centred on this incredible partnership between Ruch and Ravindra and Kane Williamson. Firstly, uh, Ravindra, you know, to cricket fans watching the game, you know, from from our armchairs, to, to see this young guy doing what he's been doing. I think the first time a rookie at a World Cup has scored three centuries, that's very notable. Uh, it, it, it is very exciting to watch. Yeah, it is. It is. You look at, I think the way the, the boys started, they 
you know, Kane obviously getting getting put into bat and and you know the way that they adapted to conditions. I think the Kiwis do that really well. Um, you know, the, the new ball moved a little bit. It looked even listening to Ratchin talk at the halftime break about the ball being a little bit slow up front. Usually the best time to bat is with, with, the, with the new ball, but it just looked like it was holding a little bit on the surface. That one that got Conway just held a little bit, that bouncer, and then when Ratchet and Kane got together, wow, I think maybe Kane could take a, a note out of his book. He obviously hasn't been hitting that many balls, but it looked as though he'd been training a lot. Yeah, um, yeah and he, he didn't look like he missed a beat, and then that just set the game up for the rest of that middle order. We've got some power there too, and Chapman came off and finished it there with Phillips and, and Sapner mm -hmm. as well. What I love about uh, Rajan Ravindra, Hess, is that he, he seems to have so many different ways of putting the pressure on a bowler. Um, you know, at times he did hit the ball very hard. Other times he was caressing it, finessing it. The, 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 the um, sharp singles that he was taking, uh, it was a very accomplished all-round batting performance. Yeah, I think you've nailed it, TJ. It's just, it's sort of beyond his years, really. He's... He plays proper cricket shots all the time. So whether he's playing through the offside or he plays a flick shot or whatever, it's all about balance. It's all about timing uh, and all about committing to the shot. Like you, you very rarely see him being half, you know, just, just basically, yeah, you very much see him, don't see him uncommitted to any shot. You know, he sees it whether he plays the pickup. You know, that one he hit off Harris Ralph in the second stand, mm -hmm. um, the second tier of the stand, was just exceptional shot. And, I mean, Munners, you're probably a good man to ask this. Like... You know, you, do you have like a bit of a cue, like, hey, if the ball's going to be in that area, this is what I'm going to play, or do you just go, hey, this ball's going to go? Because he looks like he's just he's got still got two or three options. He doesn't really commit to one. Yeah, that's right. I think um, you know, and there's no sort of premeditation whatsoever. I know it's t it's one day cricket, not T20 cricket, but um, you like you said, he hits the ball where it needs to go, um, and the yeah. way that the him and Kane played, they just accumulated and you, you look up and you go oh man they're going at seven and a half nearly eight and over they haven't really looked to do anything you know i'm, I'm trying to bat and trying to whack everything and it looks a bit <laughs> frenetic but it never it never did it never looked like that and you look up and we got 400. um so exceptional batting the way they did it was just you know outstanding and of course you know you mentioned it <clears throat> kane williamson steps out of the nets and flicks the switch 95 off 79. I guess we got so used to singing the praises of this guy over the years. But just here's another example. I think when you consider what he's been through the last you know, couple of weeks, the difficulties that he's had, there's just the sort of things that set him apart from probably 99% of other cricketers. Yeah, and it's just his timing. I think, you know, that back, that back foot punch that, you know, he hit through in front of point, went for four, just got him underway. And the, the way that he just... You know, they ran hard between the wickets. Didn't look like he had anything wrong with his knee. Um, and, yeah, they, they just put the pressure on. And the way he plays is just he, a mark of a good player when I see it is, is not the, the boundaries all the time. It's, it's how he accumulates it. And then you look up and you go, man, he's over a run a ball. You know, I've seen it when I play against guys like Joe Root and those sorts of players that, that you look up to and all of a sudden you think, oh, we, we haven't been hurt. Man, they're going at over 100 strike rate and, they, and, they, and they're flying. So... Those are, those are the toughest guys to sort of bowl to. When the guy's coming out and he's giving you chances and he's coming down the wicket and doing all those funny things, um, you know, you feel like you're in the game. But to those guys, they just never give you any chances. They don't give you a sniff. And for a while, yes, it did seem, and I think Rami's Raja said something about it in commentary, that they really did look like they'd got inside the Pakistani players' heads. And, and the body language of the Pakistani players at, at times think, you know, we're on the verge of putting these guys out for the count. Um, so, in the end, um, 402, should that have been a winning total? Or, you know, could, dare I say it, could they have made another 15 or 20, which would, could have been crucial in the long run? Oh, look, I, I think that was a perfect batting performance, to be fair, yeah. from New Zealand. I, I don't think there's, there's any flaws in that. It was an incredible partnership. Um, it definitely had that tennis ball bounce to start with. It's, a, you know, it's an early morning start over there, um, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning. There's always a little bit of moisture around. Um, so, and as soon as it flattened out, I mean, that was an incredible partnership. Kane was really selfless in terms of the way he, he just kept going and kept trying to apply the pressure. And the fact, I've seen him get out in the 90s many times because he just thinks about the team. Um, the fact he's got gone off, trying to take off, spin it down, great decision, just slightly off in terms of execution. But And then everybody that came in after that, you know, whether that be Mitchell, whether that be, you know, Satna, um, Chapman. You know, Chapman, 
they all came in and they all played incredibly well. So I, I just don't think you can find fault in a batting yeah. performance like that. Um, I think we'd be incredibly confident at half time, but still a little weary, I would have thought. Um, and then we got that early wicket, didn't we? Yeah. And then I think we probably thought, hey, you know, we're we're all over this, and, and fuck the demand certainly uh, changed our thinking. After scoring 400 plus for the first time in a cricket World Cup match, New Zealand must have thought they had a pretty good chance of defending and ending that losing run that they had had, that had put their position in the top four, just looking a little bit precarious. It wasn't to be. They did get the early break through, and, and again, a, a quite remarkable piece of play by Kane Williamson. That, that must have been a very difficult catch. Just talk us through that, Colin. Yeah, tough catch, I think, um, especially when the history of over the last couple of months with Kane, you thought, well, oh, what's he going to do now? Because he had to turn, he ran that 17 metres with a bung knee and a... Well, new knee now but um and also you know him running with with a sore thumb taking that catch i thought here we go pakistan are just going to capitulate here because they've got to go eight eight and over they're going to come out too hard and the game's ours and unfortunately it didn't happen that way um and fuck had a man had a day out and um dangerous player someone that left out at the start of the world cup sort of had something to prove and the last two games he's been outstanding so when did the alarm bells start going off here? So I thought when uh, two consecutive sixes off the, uh, the guy who'd been doing so well, um, Phillips, uh, I just started thinking, yeah, this could get away. Yeah, probably probably a little bit earlier than that for me, TJ. I think when um, I thought Sally started really nicely to, to fuck as a man, I thought, um, you know, he kept him nice and tight, bold, pretty much kept following him when he kept trying to give himself room, hit through the offside. So Sally started nicely. Um, Bolt once uh, he started bowling for left handers and it didn't swing away. You know, he got picked up two or three times through the leg side. It was one over, went for a six and a couple of fours. And at that time, it was like it's just starting to look a little bit easy. And then you're sort of thinking, hey, we don't actually have a lot more seam left. And I, and I guess that's the the point we talked briefly at the top of the show. But you know, when you've only got two seamers, you've at some stage you've got to bring in the likes of Phillips, Rutchin, um, obviously Satner, and if you've got a left hand right hand combination. It's always really difficult to contain at Chinnaswamy Stadium. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, I never really slept easy at any stage, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Sort of thought, uh, I've seen 240 get chased down in a T20 game there. So 400 was never insurmountable, unfortunately. I mean, was there any temptation, do you think, to bring Jameson straight into it? under the circumstances, or does that not really follow what you do? You know, you've got a guy who's just come in as a replacement, you, you don't rush him in. Would that be part of the thinking? I don't know. I think that's maybe one for Hess as a coach, I think. What do you reckon, Hess? Because you, you look at it and you go, there's talks about making the squad sl uh, bigger as well, in terms of, you know, you have a couple of injuries and whether somebody's out for two or three games, you want your best 11 playing the whole time. So, like, yeah. say, for instance, in, in FIFA Soccer World Cup, they've got 23, 24-man squads. When cricket, we're still in the dark ages, and we've got 15. You know, you might have one spare batter, spare, spare keeper, and, a, you know, a spinner and a, another seamer or something. So, from my point of view, it's it would arcane, be nice. Hey, yeah, it's arcane, You're yeah, right, mate. It's, try and make it a bit... Try and make it is the squads bigger. It's, it's, we, we're stuck in the dark ages yeah. where... New Zealand probably didn't play our best eleven on the day. We probably we know it. I think they know it. But if we had an, if we had Kyle Jamison there already, um, you know, it's probably too much of a risk because after Kyle Jamison, who else is going to come in after that? So, yeah, I think it's probably one for Hess to to sort of maybe pinpoint there a little bit more. It would be really interesting whether I, I would think the medical panel possibly had a say as well. Like often after a long haul flight, um, they don't want anyone to play for forty eight hours. You know, the tendons and the risk of injury is, is obviously incredibly high. So if that's the case and if Lockie Ferguson is still not recovered from the Achilles or they didn't want to risk him with, with hopefully you know, a few games to go, then New Zealand were left with no decision. Um, and that's, you know, I'm sort of thinking that's probably the way that happens. If it, if it was a selection decision and we already had three spinners and we decided to go in with a fourth one, that makes no sense to me. Because that's one ground in India where you would never, ever do that. Ever. Because it, there's only one spinner that's ever done well at that ground, and that's Yuzbendra Chahal. And all the rest of the spinners get, get bumped everywhere. And they have for many years. So it's just not one of those grounds. But you can get sucked in, as I said, by the look of the wicket. In fact, it's a day, day ground. Um, but, yeah, you just you 
just go, go down that path. So I think New Zealand must have been forced down that path due to, due to circumstance yeah. and not wanting to just go either of the quicks. So in, in the end, because of Duckworth Lewis, it's a reduced target. And I suppose, you, you know, they're halfway to the runs. They've only lost one wicket. It's probably a, a reasonably fair outcome in the end in terms of how Pakistan ended up. And I suppose the, the good thing is 21 runs uh, didn't have a, a, a devastating effect on New Zealand's net run rate. And that's important because they are still ahead of Pakistan on the table, although, as Smithy would say, by the, the barest of margins. Yeah, it is. It's, um, I think it is the fair, you know, a fair result. But another 200 runs is a lot of runs too. You get fucker out and, and bubba and bang, bang, and that's cricket. Anything can happen then you put that middle order under pressure and that's where they, they haven't done that well in, in, in this World Cup and, and, and in the past. Yeah, I think New Zealand is still very much in the front seat. I mean, they obviously got, got one game to go. Um, you know, we know we've got Sri Lanka, we've got them on the same ground, so there's no excuses there. We, we should know the facilities really nicely. In Pakistan, and playing England and going to have to win by a, by a large margin. I mean, that's, that's still, it's still quite a, quite a lot of run. You know, point, point, point four and across nine games is plenty. So, um, you know, you'd have to lose by well over 100 to, to pull back backwards that much. So um, it's still very much in our hands, but we're making it pretty challenging for ourselves, aren't we? It's all on a bit of a knife edge now. New Zealand's still in the top four, but they have one remaining game and they're going to have to win it. And they're probably going to have to win it reasonably well. That's against Sri Lanka. It's on Thursday, same ground, Chimaswamy. And, of course, there are other matches that we're going to have to take into account as well. Afghanistan have been one of the talking points of this tournament. They've got two games left. They can still make it. But South Africa and Australia, are either of them at this stage of the tournament likely to slip up against Afghanistan and open the door for them? Well, Afghanistan are a form team at the moment, aren't they? they, they... They're playing really well, um, but I don't see it. I see the South African team, you know, a lot of the middle order play in the RPL. They know how to play spin. Klassen's probably one of the best players of spin at the moment. So experience through that middle order, uh, put a few too many runs on the board there against Afghanistan and Australia, are just just doing what they need to, to, to get into that top four, I reckon. So I think you, it's in our hands. If we, if we play a good game against Sri Lanka, we'll be OK. OK, so what's... The story now with Sri Lanka, do they have to make changes? Do they bring, bearing in mind that they're playing at the same stadium, now is this the time to bring Jamison or, or hopefully Lockie Ferguson, if he was fit, back into the side and maybe address that imbalance that you've been talking about, Hess? Yeah, look, I think so. I, I think Lockie's obviously your first uh, pick. And, you know, those Achilles are difficult. You know, you, they are difficult in terms of knowing when you're going to be ready to go. And, and they tend, tend to say, like, once it's ready, give yourself another week. You know, otherwise you're just going to be straight back on the scrap heap again. So hopefully uh, Lockie's right. Uh, if not, then, you know, Kyle Jamison's going to have to come in. And against Sri Lanka, that's not a bad thing in terms of that extra bounce. And especially if there's that tennis ball bounce again, um, which it can be at that time, or a little bit too paced, then, you know, his extra height and bounce will be difficult for the Sri Lankan batters. So um, I, I think, yeah, you might get one change. Um, you've already got three spinners, so the need to have each in there at the moment is not, not required, and obviously at this ground it's not. So uh, the batting side, obviously, you're not going to touch. And, and even Chapman, I, I know Nishan came in and played incredibly well against Australia, uh, but Chapman was probably picked in the first place uh, and hadn't really put a foot wrong. So that'll be probably a decision they'll need to make, whether they want the extra seam bowling in Nishan or they're quite comfortable with what they had. So for me, it's a pretty simple plan. And then you've actually got to go hard at Sri Lanka. You can't sit back and, and expect them to fall over. The, the way India have done really well against them is they've gone really hard at them with the new ball, set aggressive fields, um, and actually you know, got the ball to swing. So if New Zealand can do that, then uh, you know, we can put them under pressure. Because mm-hmm. Sri Lanka are a team that early on in the tournament looked like they had a bit of batting, <clears throat> but not much in the way of bowling. But that, that's kind of fallen by the wayside, even rolled out for, for, for 50. I mean, sh- surely you know, New Zealand must be pretty confident of getting not just the win, but the sort of win that they need just to make sure that they expand that you know, run rate just a little bit, the net run rate. Yeah, well, it's not the first time India's done that to them in the <clears throat> Asia Cup final, um, bowling them out for, I think, just under 60, I think it was. So maybe a few demons there. Uh, we know it's a mental mental game uh, 90% of the time. So, yeah, I think New Zealand will be confident. You know, we haven't played terrible. I know we're sitting here after a loss, but we haven't played terrible cricket. I think the boys are, are confident, especially that batting unit. 
And you know, when you've got one of the best leg spinners in the world sitting sitting in Sri Lanka, um, I know it's Chennaswamy, but you know he's played there under, under Hess as well. Um, but yeah, I think the co the confidence in the New Zealand team should should be there that they're going to come up there and you know put a good performance on, beat Sri Lanka and, and head into that semi-final really confident. And of course the other match that could have a, a bearing on it, England play Pakistan. Pakistan will need to win it and win it well. Is there any chance of England getting their act together just once, maybe, at the tail end of the tournament? Because this has been a disaster for England, this tournament, and they are in danger of missing out on the, 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 the Champions Tournament, aren't they? Yeah, that's right, um, TJ. I mean, Champions Trophy is a, is a huge tournament. And for England, who are the current world champions before this, uh, this tournament, to miss out in the top eight teams in a 10-team competition uh, would not be accepted well in England, let's put it that way. So the last two games they play are going to be critical. So they went down against Australia today in a, in a game where they had chances to win it. So once again, they, they look down on confidence. That batting group certainly not playing with the freedom that we've seen from them in the past. Um, they, the bowling lineup looks a little bit limited. Adil Rashid's probably the, the exception to that. David Willey's playing well, but outside of that, they yeah they look down in confidence. But um, you know they've got enough quality in that side to certainly put a lot of pressure on Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan will have been buoyed because you, you're right, TJ. Today, uh, you know you see Babra's arm in the field and they look down. They were having a go at each other. They're down in confidence. In fact, they'll work, walk back to the hotel tonight. Well, they certainly won't walk, but they'll get back to the hotel tonight. <laughs> and they'll have, uh, have a couple of points in the back pocket. That would be more than they are expecting, that's for sure. OK. Well, look, just before we go, guys, final word. You know, you're reasonably confident that we can find our way, the Black Caps can find their way into that top four? Yes, definitely. It's a yes for me, for sure. And yes? Yeah, without doubt. I think, uh, I think we're better off for what happened tonight. And... I think we'll take on Sri Lanka with some confidence. OK, I'm going to write those predictions down. <laughs> we'll talk about them next time, mate. Eh? Sounds good. All right. Okay. And I think just a big up for, for Rutchen. Sorry, before you start, I mean, I know we talked about it, but this guy is a sensation, and, and obviously we're pretty lucky to have yep. probably a player that everybody around the world are talking about. To have three hundreds more than any New Zealander ever. Yeah. An incredible effort. And yep. probably something that hopefully is not glossed over. Yeah, let's not lose sight of that. An absolutely brilliant performance with the bat, particularly from Rachin Ravindra. How exciting it is to see this young man playing so well and looking ahead to a, a huge future in international cricket. And, of course, New Zealand still and with a pretty good shot at making the top four at this drawn-out but fascinating Cricket World Cup. We look forward to the match against Sri Lanka later on the week and our next edition of No Boundaries. I hope you'll join us then. Matewa.